Merry Christmas. The 12 days of Tiski has brought us to Christmas Day, and today we are looking back at the month of June. It was when the Black Lives Matter movement really went global. The killing of George Floyd by a white police officer had brought to the fore issues of racial injustice in the United States. And with people pent up after three months of COVID restrictions, this time around, they really exploded worldwide. In Britain, that manifested most dramatically in the felling of a statue of a prolific slave trader, Edward Colston. In response to that action, we saw liberals and conservatives hand-wringing about the fact that, for example, slavery wasn't so bad actually at the time, or I wish they'd have done it, but just democratically and peacefully. Let's take a look at myself, Aaron and Ash, debunking those points one by one. On Sunday at the Bristol Black Lives Matter demonstration, a statue of slave trader Edward Colston was pulled down by protesters. Let's take a look at the dramatic footage. So after being pulled down, the statue was rolled from the city centre to Bristol's harbour. This is what happened next. So this is a slave trader responsible for the trafficking of 84,000 Africans to the Americas to be sold into slavery. 19,000 died on the journey. It's obviously an outrage that this statue was ever allowed to stay in Bristol city centre for so long. Um, but the fact that he was dragged to the harbour and thrown in the sea, like so many of his victims, um, has a certain poetic justice to it. Um, Ash, what's your take on the scenes we saw in Bristol this weekend? Pure, unadulterated joy. It's it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Um, I got a like barrage of texts from like one of my friends, which was just like, "This is great." He's in the bottom of the river. Stop whining. No one can do anything about it. Done now in the harbor. And I think what I love about it is that we've become so used to politics being this thing which happens through the sort of grinding negotiations in Parliament within institutions which are ultimately frustrating and haven't been able to deliver the kind of social change or justice that people really, really need. And to have a political action just cut through that and for the statue to be taken down, not because of this long drawn out battle with a council or some kind of petition to a higher authority, but because a young and diverse crowd led by black people said, we're not going to have this anymore, staring at us, the celebration of a man who's responsible the enslavement of thousands of people, the deaths of at least 19,000 people in the Middle Passage, he's gone. He's in the harbour. And as you said, the symbolism of that happening in the very docks where his slave ships would come in and the fact he's at the bottom of that water rusting, just love it. Yeah, you, you've seen sort of various people offer sort of soporific platitudes today, whether it's Keir Starmer or Rishi Sunak saying that this isn't how justice is administered. I would disagree. What we saw on Sunday in Bristol is pure, unadulterated justice. It's a justice that can't be performed by bureaucracy and by paper clips and by pens and tick boxes. And by the way, I don't say that in a sort of dismissive way. All of those things are needed uh, for the everyday uh, reproduction of a liberal democratic society. But it was an instantiation, I think, of of, of pure justice. I mean, I, I, I sound like Robert Pierre, perhaps, but I can't think of many other ways sort of to put it. And there's a beautiful picture of a young black guy with Black Lives Matter t-shirt, Black Lives Matter face mask with his knee on the neck of the statue. A young black guy next to him with a, uh, a t-shirt saying something about Trump. Trump, Donald Trump, Trump is a waste man. And it's like, if you wanted to, and I don't want to aestheticize it too much because it's a very political action born of a great deal of suffer historic suffering. But if you wanted to almost sort of, you know, compose a sort of historic painting, justice, it would it would look like this. Uh, and I kind of, you know, I mean, look, we'll, we'll talk about the sort of uh, the sort of political responses to it, but uh, I, I didn't expect them to be quite so bad. I mean, we are talking about a former slave trader. Um, there we are. First of all, what I want us to do is address, and I imagine debunk, the sort of two main forms of criticism which have been thrown at this action on Sunday. So the first of them is this idea that we shouldn't erase history. So first, this comes in the form of people saying, 
you know, it, we can't get rid of statues because that's trying to erase our history. That's trying to pretend our past is something it wasn't. And the other closely related brand is the one that says, oh, people in the past, they all had problematic views and problematic activities and ways of making a living that now we seem are completely, we see to be completely unacceptable. So our, our example of this um, from today is surprise, surprise, Julie Hartley Brewer, talk radio host. Um, so she tweets, breaking news. Almost every single person from British and world history probably doesn't share your values today and almost certainly did bad things at a time when they weren't necessarily thought to be bad things and which you won't like. But that might be fine for something like flares, but this was slavery. I mean, the 84,000 people he was transporting from Africa to the Americas, I don't think they thought it was fine at the time. Also, I think, I mean, this is just a complete category error in, in this particular issue, because Winston Churchill, right? We, we, I mean, he was a colonialist and a racist, but he's also remembered for helping to defeat the Nazis. He's someone with a complicated past. Edward Colston was just a slave trader who gave some money to charity. That's his only legacy. So this idea that we're going to cancel him because he did something, pro the only thing he's famous for is the slave trade. So the fact that you would celebrate him is nonsense. And of course, we have learned more about Edward Colston from this action, him being thrown into the harbour, than we ever have from that statue standing. I sort of would beg you to find anyone in this country who knew much about, well, a, a few people in this country would have known something about Edward Colston before this, but the number will have dramatically increased since this action. I don't know about you, but I was very surprised when I went to Germany and I didn't see a single swastika or Nazi statue uh, when I was wandering around Berlin, because I thought, why would they want to erase their history like that? You know, oh, you might not be familiar. There was this guy, Hitler, he was in charge of Germany. You probably won't have heard of him because he didn't see any statues around. Um, and when you make that comparison, right, which is that N Germany obviously did confront confront its Nazi history, had to go undergo a program of denazification. And that didn't lead to a forgetting of the horrors of the Nazi regime, but rather the ability to remember it correctly because you weren't left with these objects which is integrated into your everyday fabric of reality, which made it seem like all those things were okay. So not only do I, uh, you know, reject the idea that you're erasing history by taking down these statues, I actually propose the idea that by having a confrontation uh, with these statues, by tearing it down, by having this political moment of throwing it into the harbour, that it's a better historical education than leaving it up ever was. The whole thing about, oh, you know, historical context, it requires nuance of the tens of thousands of people trafficked in the ships, uh, which, you know, were overseen by, was it the Royal African Company? Uh, of, of the tens of thousands of people trafficked basically from uh, West Africa to Britain's colonies in uh, the West Indies. How many of them do you think were saying, well, you know, look, there's a debate to be had here, actually, and there's a bit of nuance. And yes, about 15 to 20 percent of us are dying on ship and they're throwing some people over overboard and we've been ripped out of our, our culture, our, our society. We're going somewhere we've never been before. We're going to be brutalized. But, but look, there's two sides of the story here. No. Nobody who was a slave thought there was nuance and context. So this whole thing is ridiculous. The only people that thought what they were doing was okay were the people making money from it who weren't the slaves, and they chose to give a blind eye to evil because they they profited from it. So I mean, it's not like we're talking about oh yeah, in Africa there was a you know a, there was also a conversation on the Gold Coast, and many people volunteered to be slaves. And actually, it's more complicated. This is just bullshit. It's just so stupid and dumb. Who actually thinks this? Actually, I can tell you, it's people like Julia Hartley Brewer. Nobody who engages their brain and thinks about this logically for more than 10 seconds buys the line that there's a context-specific nuanced issue. There have been slave insurrections since forever, since, you know, the Roman age, since, uh, you know, uh, in antiquity. It's talked about very frequently. So it's absolute garbage. In terms of the question of, of history remembering, I thought this was very nice from Bristol Council. I mean, we can talk about why... why they'd allowed the statue to to remain up for so long, but I thought their response to it falling was quite nice. So let's get up this picture. They've collected all the signs that were laid in the city after yesterday's Black Lives Matter protest, and they're going to preserve them on display in the History Museum. Um, let's go to the other form of opposition to this action from Sunday, the idea that the statue should have come down, or it would have been fine if it came down, but only if it had happened via the legal means. 
And we're going to go to a tweet by Sajid Javid now as the representative of this position. I grew up in Bristol. I detest how Edward Colston profited from the slave trade, but this is not okay. If Bristolians want to remove a monument, it should be done democratically, not by criminal damage. Now, that might seem like a reasonable point. It's definitely more reasonable than the one that Julia Hartley Brewer came out with. But there is a problem. There has been a long-standing campaign to try and remove this particular statue from the centre of Bristol, and in fact from the names of, of, of um, schools, of concert halls, all, all sorts of institutions around Bristol are named after this slave trader, and all of them have been blocked. Um, so in fact, not only plans to take this statue down have been blocked, but even completely minor ones to put a plaque on that puts his existence that statue in proper context, even something so minor was blocked by normal democratic channels or normal you know, legitimate political channels, as Sajid Javid would, would call them. I want to get up a passage from the Bristol Post. This was from an article last year explaining the difficulty of getting a statement agreed. This, is, this was an idea as the plaque that was going to go under the statue. Originally, it was a free paragraph statement which revealed how Colston played an active role in the enslavement of more than 84,000 Africans, including 12,000 children, and of those, 19,000 died on board his ships. It was controversial, at least for one Tory councillor, Richard Eddy, who said that he objected so strongly to the wording that he said he would understand if it was vandalised or stolen. I wonder what he says now. But then... Bristol Live revealed last August that there was a significant problem. A Bristol historian, Francis Greenacre, on behalf of the Merchant Venturers, the organisation Colston belonged to, which still holds services and commemorations in his honour today, got involved. A debate ensued, with the wording of the plaque changing gradually, with Mr Greenacre challenging it, removing things like his position as a Tory MP, changing the word traffic to transported, and maintaining a lengthy dispute about the numbers and ages of the thousands of children who died on board Colston ships. So uh, there you have it. There was a, there was a long, drawn-out campaign. That was you know, the pinnacle of a 25-year campaign to try and get either this statue removed or put in context. And the people who were part of you know, the same organization that Colston was part of were not happy unless you had a sort of mealy mouthed statement underneath there that, you know, well, there should be no nuance, but that's what they're trying to do. Trying to say, oh, this wasn't as simple as it was. Was it 84,000? Was it 64,000? Like, what the fuck? So this idea that people should have just, you know, why, why didn't people think to start a petition? Why didn't people think to lobby their council people? They'd been doing that for decades. We don't have statues by accident. We don't have monuments by accident. We don't have memorialization by accident. They have to be preserved and they have to be maintained. And so what we have when it comes to the Edward Colston statue is one, the fact it went up in what was it 1895. So the statue goes up, you know, what? well over 60 years after the Slavery Abolition Act passes, which outlawed slavery in the British Empire in 1833. And on the original plaque, it said he was amongst, you know, the wisest men in the city, you know, one of the best and wisest men. So you have this kind of, quite literally, a whitewashing of the role slave money has played in building the city of Bristol and also building this man's reputation and his legacy immediately when the statue goes up. But it's not enough to put a statue up, you have to keep it up. And that's why you need these strange organisations with their kind of pet historians like Francis Greenacre to make the case of why this slaver was a good slaver or why the slave trading he did wasn't particularly bad. And if you actually looked at the issues, and what it does is that it just creates noise. It just creates a, a, a kind of fog around the issue. So you lose sight of the very clear moral point which is why are we celebrating a slave trader in a diverse city in the 21st century that's what the whole thing is about and it's a way of clogging up the political process now this is where i differ from both sajid javid and i'm sure we'll talk about him later keir starmer i actually think that that protest and the action of those protesters i don't think it was violent people didn't get hurt it was a statue he doesn't have nerve endings he doesn't have feelings i think it was a legitimate political action because the so-called legitimate means by which politics takes place of petitioning the council or writing to this person or writing an article it had no effect because the
those processes have been corrupted and corroded by the lingering poison of slavery. Thank you.